let these guys see you. And then let's make sure we open our Bibles to Acts chapter 20. We're back into Paul's third missionary journey. That's where we've been in the long, big scheme of things. We're making our way through the book of Acts, Luke's account of how the gospel expanded from Jerusalem through Judea and Samaria and then even to the remotest parts of the earth for them, the Roman Empire. And Paul is on his third missionary journey. And so what I want to do is I want to reacquaint you right away with, of course, the map that we've been using. I know you've missed it the last three weeks or so. So I just want to put the map back up for you and remind you of what the third missionary journey looked like. It all began in Antioch of Syria. That's the home church that Paul uh, went from for his three missionary journeys. Uh, as a Gentile church. And Paul, um, in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, left uh, for his third missionary journey. He traveled back through the southern Galatian region. These were all churches that he had planted on his first missionary journey. And it says in Acts chapter 18, verse 23, that he strengthened the disciples here. So this is uh, about the third time that he has gone back through and strengthened these churches, these disciples of Jesus in these Gentile churches. And then he made his way finally. The focal point of the third missionary journey becomes the city of Ephesus, which is right here. Um, that whole uh, account begins with uh, the story of Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila being there, the kind of the introductory scene of how the gospel was being preached in Ephesus without Paul before Paul got there. Once Paul finally gets there in Acts chapter 19, the entire chapter, not chapter 19 verses 1 through 41 or something like that, is all about Paul's ministry in Ephesus. We learn that while Paul is in Ephesus, he has a desire to go back through Macedonia and into Greece and visit the Gentile churches there. Um, Macedonia is this region over here on the European continent. Greece is the area down here, including Achaia, this province. And so Paul, at the end of his missionary journey, um, or after his time in Ephesus, left and he traveled up north and he went into Macedonia and he came down into um, Achaia. He had to flee back up this way because there was a plot from the Jews against him. And he eventually sailed back down to Troas and then eventually came to the port city about 30 miles away from Ephesus, the port city called Miletus. And this is where we meet Paul now. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 16, it says that Paul was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, if at all possible, because what he wanted to do is he wanted to be in Jerusalem for uh, Pentecost, for the day of Pentecost. And so in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, um, from Miletus, he sent to the church in Ephesus for the elders, and he called the elders to himself. Now, when you see the word elders, that doesn't just mean he called for the old guys in the church. Uh, by Paul's time, elder did not necessarily mean old men or older men, but it had become an official term um, recognizing that a man was a qualified leader over the church. That's what the word elder meant. Uh, any man uh, of just about any age can be an elder upon meeting the biblical qualifications set out for such an office in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1. And then what I want you to see in Acts chapter 20, as we're still kind of getting started here, what, what Paul is doing is, is he's calling together the leaders of the church. And we get to listen in on what Paul is going to say to these men. They're the elders. Let me give you another term for elders that's in the passage here. You'll see it in a moment when we read it. But look down at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So there's another word for the same office. Paul is not talking to these elders and now all of a sudden calling them something different that's different from what they are. An elder is an overseer, one who watches over the church. Now there's a third term that's important, and it's in verse 28. Also right after that, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd, to shepherd the church of God. Um, elders are men who watch over, who oversee the church for the purpose of shepherding. They're pastoral. An elder is an overseer who is a pastor. That is who Paul is speaking to. That's who he's gathering together from the church in Ephesus. Now, here's your quiz. How many elders 
does Grace Bible Church have? Flip over your bulletin, look on the back and a little part and count the names and the emails. There's eight, right? Okay. Second question, how many overseers does Grace Bible Church have? Eight, good. But how many pastors does Grace Bible Church have? Eight, right answer. Pastor is elder is overseer. Pastor is not the guy that you see up front most of the time teaching the word of God and the rest are elders. Pastor is overseer is elder. That's what we believe because that's what the New Testament says. Um, I'm not the chief elder. I'm not the senior pastor. I am a pastor who gets to do most of the preaching and I get to oversee along with the other elders. And Scott was up here earlier pastoring you and all of the elders pastor. Uh, it's important to understand that. And what we get to do is we get to listen in on Paul addressing the elders. So let's do that. Let me read from verse 17 through verse 38 of Acts chapter 20. And then today we'll just deal with the first few verses. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials which come upon me through the plots of the Jews, and how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify solemnly of the the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that all of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. And then here's the climax of the section, because this is where the commands come. Be on guard for yourselves, elders, and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you, that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and he prayed with them all. And they began to weep aloud. And they embraced Paul and repeatedly kissed him, grieving especially over the word which he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they were accompanying him to the ship. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this glimpse that we get into um, what an apostle, the great apostle Paul, thinks about the church and what he thinks about eldering Lord, it gives us an opportunity to think about what we are as a body of Christ, a local gathering of believers in Jesus, and it gives us an opportunity to think about what it means to be an elder, an overseer, a shepherd. Lord, would you, even in this important subject, help us to set our minds on your thinking. Lord, we've experienced lots of different churches, perhaps perhaps we have been exposed to a lot of different styles of leadership, 
Perhaps we have our own thoughts about what a church is and should be. Lord, may we submit all of our thinking to your word and align ourselves with your thoughts. Lord, I pray that you would preserve Grace Bible Church for generations to come until Jesus comes back. And it's in his great name we pray, amen. Well, we discover an interesting piece of information about Paul that's been popping up in every city that he has been at as he has traveled up to Macedonia, down to Greece, and back and around. He tells the elders that the Holy Spirit has been testifying to him solemnly in every city that he's been that trouble awaits him in Jerusalem, bonds and afflictions. Paul actually believes the trouble awaiting very well may cost him his life. Verse 24, I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. His apostleship, for all he knows, may be on its last days, and he wants to meet with the elders because his heart is burdened. What is his heart burdened with? As he takes potentially his last steps ever as a missionary, as an apostle, what's on his mind? It's the local church, and in particular, the one in Ephesus. And who is going to think rightly of that church when he is gone? He has spent three years there, longer than he had spent anywhere else on any missionary journey. That's why he calls the elders of the church of Ephesus to him in Miletus. They must think rightly about the church, and they must see it as he does, as an apostle. He's revealing what the church is through revelation as a prophet and an apostle. And the whole climax of his exhortation to them in this chapter is found where the imperatives are. I pointed that out to you in verse 28 down to verse 31. This precious church, and what makes the church precious is the price that was paid to form it. It was purchased with the blood of Jesus, his blood. This precious church must be protected. And what's very interesting in what he says in verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you uh, into the church, not sparing the flock. And verse 30, from your own selves, men will arise. Who's he talking to? Who's he talking to? The elders. From among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. This precious church that has been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ must be protected by the elders from the elders. That's what he's saying. They must be protected by the elders from the elders. They are about to learn that the greatest threat to the church exists within their own ranks. And this exhortation concerning the church to the elders is, is woven throughout a very emotional discourse. Paul thinks this is the last time he's going to see them. You can see tears are mentioned and tears are shed in this passage. This is an emotional retelling of Paul's history with the Ephesian elders and the church of Ephesus. And listen, what's true for them is true for any church of any age and true for us. If, if a church is vulnerable to any danger... It is primarily vulnerable to the danger within the church, particularly the danger that can arise from within the very team of elders if they are not on the alert and if they are not guarding themselves. Verse 28, do you notice that? Be on guard for yourselves. Who is he talking to? The elders. Elders guard the elders. Watch over them and the flock. It has to begin there. The church is in grave danger if elders do not view themselves rightly and watch over each other rightly. If, if they don't do that, that danger opens the door for more danger and the church can quickly be deceived and led astray. Verse 9, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, men will arise and they will speak 
perverse things and they will draw away the disciples after them. These are about as sobering words you could speak to an elder as you can imagine. These are difficult words to say to the elders. But if the elders will receive Paul's exhortation, the church has hope. And that is why I've given it the title over the whole chapter, Hope for the Church, Through the Elders. Two things are true at the same time. Here, here's this. Listen, just by way of introduction still that we understand this, what, what's going on here in this whole chapter. Two things are true at the same time. One of the greatest dangers to the church is her elders when they are not thinking rightly and being obedient to Scripture. One of the greatest dangers to the church is her hel- elders. And this is true at the same time. One of the greatest hopes for the church is her elders who are thinking rightly and submitting themselves to Scripture when they watch over one another. So how Paul goes about this whole instruction to the elders that will indeed preserve the church is what we're going to focus on in the weeks to come in pieces one at a time. How For today, I've got a subtitle. I'll put it up there for you just for our section today, verses 17 down through 21. Here's kind of a subtitle for today's message. The Trustworthy Apostle who brings exhortation, who instructs the elders. How does Paul begin this message to the elders? This is a difficult message to bring to them. Notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't just start with the imperatives. He doesn't jump right into the imperatives that are found down in verse 28. He begins rather by reminding the elders of his own ministry to them and among them, and they know it. They know what it was like for him to be there. He was with them for three years. They know him, and they can trust their apostle and their friend who is instructing them concerning the church. Paul makes this difficult instruction, these difficult truths come easier to them, and he makes it easier for them to receive these difficult sayings by reminding them of who he was and who he is to them. That's where Paul begins, and that is what this passage today is all about. What is it all about? I have it for you up on the screen. Why why could the elders trust Paul? Why could they trust Paul as he delivered difficult but profitable exhortations to them for the church? Three reasons. Number one, Paul was undeniably pledged to them. Why could the elders trust Paul? Because he was undeniably pledged to them. Look at verse 18. When they had come to him, he said to them, You yourselves know from the first day that I set in foot Asia how I was with you the whole time. You yourselves know this. He isn't going to tell them anything that they don't already know about him. Paul's ministry to um, the believers in Ephesus was not carried out primarily behind closed doors, and therefore they just have to take his word for how he cared for them when they didn't see him do it. No, they knew firsthand how he had cared for them. And Paul says, I was with you the whole time. That's the main idea. From his very first day stepping foot into Asia, he was with them. Paul could not be separated away from these believers in Ephesus. There was not a day that he was not with them. He bound himself to them. He was linked to them inseparably so. And they knew it. What no one could deny was that Paul pledged himself to them in a way unlike to any other believers in all of Asia. He was pledged to them. He was with them the whole time from the first day he set foot in Asia. The one who's about to bring some very difficult truths and words to them about the dangers within their own elder team is the one who had been pledged to them from the very first day, and that would help them to receive those difficult but profitable exhortations that are coming. And that leads us then to the second reason that the elders could trust Paul to instruct them concerning the church. Number two, Paul was selflessly enslaved to the Lord. Why could they trust Paul? He was selflessly enslaved to the Lord, verse 19. He was serving the Lord with all humility. Um, What did Paul's life and ministry among them look like? It looked like slaving. That's literally the word. Slaving for the Lord Jesus. Paul thought of himself as a slave. That means this word for slaving means that 
his own will, his own wants were nowhere in front of him, but only the will and the wants of his master and Lord, who is Jesus. Paul was a slave. He emptied himself of his own will, his own wants, and he was only consumed with the will and the wants of his Lord Jesus. What he himself might want didn't matter. What Jesus wanted was what mattered while he was with the Ephesians. Listen to the ring of this. He was with them slaving for the Lord. He was with them slaving for the Lord. You see, his interest was the Ephesians, but his master was Jesus. He was pledged to them, but he was enslaved, not to them, but to the Lord while he was pledged to them. He was with them, but he didn't bind himself to their will. He wasn't their slave. He was with them, but he did not bind himself under his own wants. He was with them, rather, but was bound as a slave under the Lord Jesus. That means that when Paul was with them, his only concern every day in every situation was carrying out the wishes of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The very best care that Paul could bring to them and give to them as an apostle was the care that a slave of Jesus Christ could give to them. There's a general principle that's true here just about being a believer in Jesus Christ. We're all bondservants of Christ. We're all slaves of Christ. The best profit that you can bring to any relationship comes when you slave for the Lord in that relationship. Do you want your spouse to be blessed in your relationship with your spouse? Then don't become a slave of their wants. Be a slave of what Jesus wants. Do you want to be a blessing and bring blessing to your children? You don't do that by becoming their buddy and giving them what they want. You do that by only being consumed with what Jesus wants for them. For your parents, for your boss, for your employees, for strangers, for anybody, the way that you bring your most good, you are most effective as a believer in Jesus Christ when you are a slave of Jesus. When Paul was slaving for the Lord Jesus among them, they profited greatly. And they, then, they knew this for themselves. This wasn't a surprise report to them. You yourselves know this. The one who is about to say some very difficult t- things to them about their very own elder team is not one who speaks from what he wants or what he thinks is best, but he speaks to them as a slave of Jesus. What Jesus wants for the elders of Ephesus eclipses what Paul wants. They can trust what Paul will say. And just so the elders had a clear picture of what Paul's slaving for the Lord looked like among them, Paul gave it three descriptions. Look at verse 19. I was slaving for the Lord with all humility. First, with all humility. Of course that would be what slaving for another person looks like. It's humble. It's humbleness. It's being humbled. There was no self-promotion, there was no self-advancement, there was no self-exaltation in any of Paul's ministry among them. Slaving for the Lord Jesus ceases to be slaving when humility is dropped and pride is picked up. Paul was a humble man. He was humbled. And they knew that. They didn't have to wait for a report from Paul to discover that he was humble. You yourselves know this, he says. And this would help them to receive the difficult but profitable imperatives that are coming because it's a humbled slave who is delivering them. The second description, Paul slaving for the Lord also came with tears. What Paul wants to recall for them that they themselves knew was that there was a steady stream of heartbreak and tears flowing in his slaving for them as he slaved for the Lord among them. Slaving for Jesus among them was heartbreaking enough for Paul that it met his list of three descriptions he wanted to give. That means it was a regular part of slaving for the Lord among them was heartbreak, disappointment. Was Paul a man of joy? Absolutely. You can read Philippians all about that. And he writes that while he's in jail, right? But what Paul puts the accent on here for the elders is his tears as a slave. 
sadness of heart was in ministry. And they remembered this. And this would help them to receive some heartbreaking but profitable instruction. Paul was a tender man whose heart frequently broke for those he was among as a slave for Jesus. So if tears come for these men, or rather, when tears come for these elders, they won't be surprised. Tears, sadness of heart, are not an anomaly in shepherding the church. And then the final description, Paul slaving for the Lord also came, number three, with trials which came upon him through the plots of the Jews. Verse 19, attacks from his own Jewish people came upon him in every city where there were Jews. I don't think there was an exception. Here's how it began in Ephesus. Look back at chapter 19, verse 8. You'll see this. And so Paul entered the synagogue and he continued speaking out boldly for three months in Ephesus, in the synagogue there reasoning, persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. There was obviously much more that came about as well. Paul's life was frequently in jeopardy as he slaved for the Lord while he was among them. And that too would help them to receive these difficult imperatives that are coming. The man speaking hard truth to them was one who didn't back off for slaving for Jesus even when plots were being carried out against him from the Jews. You don't ignore a man like that when he's talking to you. Paul was selflessly enslaved to the Lord while he was with them. He was undeniably pledged to them. If the elders will listen to him, the church in Ephesus will have hope. The last reason for today um, that we'll cover today that the elders could trust Paul is this. Number three, Paul was fearlessly committed to truth. Verses 20 and 21. They could trust him because he was fearlessly committed to the truth. They knew this well for themselves. Verse 20, they knew how, Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And teaching you publicly from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The better translation probably of verse 20, of the main idea in the verse, it would be this. I shrank from nothing of the profitable things. I shrank from nothing of the profitable things. That's probably the clearest way to translate it. Maybe we could illustrate it this way. Imagine Paul making a list of the truths that would be profitable for them to hear. Here's a list of all of the truths that are profitable for you to hear. And then he takes that list and he subdivides it into two lists. These are the easy, delightful truths to say to believers. And these are the difficult ones to say to believers. Which of those two lists of truths would be a temptation to shrink back from in fear. Nobody shrinks back from saying something delightful to one another, right? I mean, it's when you have to say the difficult thing where the temptation arises to shrink back. And what is it that Paul is saying? I shrank from nothing of the profitable things. They themselves knew this about Paul. How many of those profitable things that are difficult to say did he shrink back from? Not one. This was not new information for them they would just have to, that they would have to just take Paul's word for. This would help them to receive the profitable things that he's going to soon tell them about themselves, even though it might be difficult to hear. You see, Paul never pulled punches with these men before. He didn't shrink back in fear from difficult things that were profitable for them before, and they knew that, and they could trust this one who was speaking to them. Well, how did Paul communicate those difficult but profitable things? Verse 20, I did not shrink from declaring and teaching, from declaring and teaching you. Declaring them and teaching. If Paul had to announce or declare truths that were difficult to say and difficult to receive, he announced them. 
And if he had to take more time and actually instruct the Ephesians concerning the difficult truths that would profit them, well, he did that too. Where did Paul do this? Verse 20, publicly and from house to house. Publicly with the congregation. Paul could tell them all at once in the assembly the difficult things that would profit them. He wouldn't shrink back in fear from the assembly. And then one-on-one in their homes, based on specific needs within individuals within that household, he could also tell them one at a time the difficult things that would profit them. He wouldn't shrink back in fear from any individual. That was their experience over the last three years. Didn't matter where Paul was, if there was something difficult to say that would bring them profit, he didn't shrink back from them in fear, whether he was one-on-one with them or he was with the whole assembly. An example, I think, is given to us by Paul of how he did not shrink back from what was profitable, even though it might have been difficult to receive. Verse 21 solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's talk about repentance and faith first and then we'll come back to how this is an example of something difficult to say but very profitable. What is repentance? Repentance, as you well know, is an about face in your mind. It is turning your back on what you have been thinking and walking in a new direction of thought. It is a radical change of mind. It is 180 degrees worth of a change in mind that then results in a radical change of living, a change of conduct. The kind of, this kind of turning only happens toward God, of course. It is repentance toward God. It's a radical change of mind concerning who God is And what he has done to save sinners through his son Jesus, you turn in thought towards him and turn your living toward him as well. And that radical change of mind concerning God, it translates into an equally radical change of living towards God. What is faith? Faith is similar in many ways in that it too is a great turning away from trusting self. We come out of the womb doing this. You don't have to be told to trust in yourself, to live for yourself, to honor yourself, to love yourself. We just do that. But faith is to no longer entrust yourself, but instead to cast everything that you know about yourself upon everything that you know about Jesus. And the whole rest of your life is more and more discovery of what you learn about yourself and still having to cast more of what you learn uh, about, of yourself upon Jesus as you grow in your knowledge of him. And let's face it, Paul would have found this to be true, and so have you if you've ever called somebody to repent and believe. Have you, have you ever done that? Have you ever called someone else to repent and believe? Let's face it, in this world, there's probably no more difficult truth to receive than this one. Repent and believe. Repent toward God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's difficult. That's difficult but entirely profitable, spiritually speaking. But you see, what you're telling someone is that their thinking, their mindset, is just not kind of, sort of, slightly off, but completely off. There is a right way to think, and they have been completely wrong. That's what you're saying when you call them to repent. You see, they must not just add to their current thinking about God just another thought about God that you gave them. Here, just add this truth about God to your current way of thinking. That's not repentance. Rather, they must abandon their current way of thinking about God for an entirely new thought about God that they never came up with on their own. The gospel introduces it. And that is an offensive, difficult thing in this world, but it is an extremely profitable thing 
spiritually speaking. If you are a believer in Christ, the only reason you are is because someone did that very difficult thing with you. Is it not, not true? Salvation cannot come apart from that kind of difficult repentance. And what are you also telling someone is this, that everything you've ever been taught in an American way of life concerning believe in yourself is not just slightly off, but what? Completely off. You don't invite someone, an unbeliever, to put some confidence in Jesus right next to their self-confidence in their heart. That's not what you're doing as a believer in Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel. In the preaching of the gospel, you plead with the sinner to completely abandon self-trust in order to completely entrust themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross and through his empty tomb. And that is completely offensive to an independent American sinner. Salvation for you did not come apart from you doing that. Someone had to say that to you. It wasn't helpful for you for them to muddy the waters about what real faith is or what repentance actually is. It was helpful when they were clear and they said the difficult truth and you profited greatly. And by the way, repentance and faith are inseparable. Where one is truly, genuinely found, there you find the other, right? The idea that you could repent but not believe or the idea that you could believe but you didn't have to change, unheard of in Scripture. The imagination of men, that's what that is. And Paul didn't, I, I love this about him, he didn't suggest to them to repent and believe. And, and he didn't wonder out loud in front of them if they should repent and believe. And he didn't ask what they thought about whether they should repent and believe. Look at verse 21. He, he solemnly testified of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That means he acted toward them like a witness who knew of their guilt before a holy God, that he knew that they were doomed under the judge. And his holy sentence of condemnation was upon them, and he knew that. And as a faithful witness, he solemnly testified to them to repent, to change, and to believe in Christ. Why don't we see more people profiting from the difficult truths of repentance and faith. Maybe we don't see more people profiting from the difficult truths of repentance and faith because we've left it out of our message. We've shrunk back from it in fear. It's hard to say. And so I asked, when, when was the last time you said to anybody, you called them to repent, to believe? It's difficult to say, isn't it? It's difficult to receive. And so it is easy to leave it out of the message, to shrink back in fear from saying what is necessary. Maybe we don't see more people profiting from the difficult truths of repentance and faith because we're not solemnly testifying to them to do so. Perhaps we've made it a suggestion that they can take or leave. Maybe we don't see more people profiting from the difficult truths about repentance because we haven't made clear just how off their thinking is. They will never repent in a biblical fashion if they think that they can just add some new thoughts about God to their current thinking. You see, biblical repentance comes only through the abandonment of their current thinking about God. And perhaps... We don't see more people profiting from the difficult truths of faith, the truth of faith, because we haven't made clear that they must only, only trust in Jesus. If self-trust is allowed to linger in our message, and all they need to do is just add some 
trust of Jesus to sit next to the throne of self-trust in their heart, saving faith won't come. The United States is full of believers. Believers in self. Is that not true? Can you think of any more accurate description of Americans and people who believe in themselves? As long as a sinner finds himself to be trustworthy, trusting Jesus will never truly come. As long as a sinner thinks that he can trust Jesus alongside still trusting in himself, salvation will not come. Paul didn't shrink from telling them to repent and believe. Have you this morning, can it be said of you that you've genuinely repented, that you have truly believed upon Jesus Christ to be saved? This morning, our passage, and, and I call you to repent in that sense. Change your mind radically so. Abandon your thoughts of God that you've had. Abandon them for biblical thinking about God. No longer trust in yourself. Abandon trust in yourself. That's what you want to stand before God and appeal to one day is that you trusted in yourself to do what, you, what he demands. Instead, cast yourself upon Christ. Paul didn't shrink from telling them to repent and believe. They were on his list of difficult truths to say and to receive, but they were very profitable things to say, to receive. It didn't matter if they were Greeks or Jews. He solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't play favorites with races or ethnicities, and they knew this themselves about him. This is not new information to them. If they were profiting spiritually because Paul didn't shrink back in fear from calling them to repent and believe, well, then they could profit yet once again from him through the difficult things that he's about to say. Why could the elders trust Paul to deliver difficult but profitable exhortations to them? Three reasons this morning to begin with. One, Paul was undeniably pledged to them. Secondly, Paul was selflessly enslaved to the Lord. And thirdly, Paul was fearlessly committed to the truth, no matter how difficult it was to receive. Now, I'll give you more reasons next week, Lord willing, as we continue on, but I have some closing thoughts for elders and members alike that just stood out to me in this passage. First, spiritual growth thrives among believers who have pledged themselves to one another. I love how Paul says that he um, was with them the whole time. Um, that's not just something that an apostle does. That's a Christian thing to do, to be pledged like that to others. And spiritual growth is stunted. It becomes stagnant where believers are distant from one another. So you can be a part of a church but not really be connected to the people and therefore your growth stagnates. The greater your intimacy with one another, the greater spiritual growth can come to you, but there is a risk in that as well, is there not? Because you being a flawed sinner drawing near to another flawed sinner, there's bound to be some sparks that come the closer you get to one another. So number two, maintaining a slave of Jesus mindset is your best protection against discouragement in the body. Listen, you are only going to disappoint one another. You are only going to discourage one another just by being you, just by being alive and living that life in front of others. But to truly be a slave of Jesus is to empty yourself of you, to empty yourself of your wants. And then listen to this, to be a slave of Jesus is to empty yourself of your timetable for others. To be empty of your timetable for change for others. Look, you may want very good things, very biblical things. You may be informed from Scripture about what it is you want for your spouse, what you want for your children, what you want for your small group. You may be right, and you may be right for wanting it now, but a slave of Jesus recognizes that it's even his timetable. Should you have repented sooner? Should you have gotten the latest growth spurt sooner than you did? Yes, you should have, but it's all on God's timetable, and I am not the Spirit, and you are not the Holy Spirit, and you are not the Lord in somebody else's life. And so the way to maintain 
contentment with one another and love for one another and patience with one another is to maintain the slave mindset. You be among one another, but slave for the Lord Jesus. Your best protection against discouragement in relationships is to maintain a lowly slave mindset. Number three, most... Most need reminding that some of the most profitable truths are difficult things to say to each other. Most of us entrap ourselves into a thinking. We talk ourselves into an incomplete thought, line of thought here. And it's this, that profitable things are the delightful things to say to one another. Um, And oftentimes they are. And if it's difficult to say, well... Maybe it's not profitable, or we could easily talk ourselves into thinking how it could not be profitable for them because it's difficult. By the very nature that it's difficult to say, it's probably not profitable for them. But I don't have any trouble telling other people about that. Isn't that interesting? We really enjoy seeing others profit from things that are easy, delightful to say. Don't you enjoy that? see something encouraging in your children, you see something encouraging in your spouse, in your small group, and it's a delight to say that thing and to watch them profit from it. We get that. That is wonderful. That is encouraging. But then when we're faced with something difficult to say, that will bring profit to our spouse, to our children, to our parents, to our small group. And we know they'll profit from it. It's just easy to shrink back in fear because we become afraid of losing the comfort that we have with one another in the relationship, and we just want things to stay like they are. It's very difficult. Most of us need reminding that some of the most profitable truths are difficult things to say to each other. And then number four, there are some, in contrast to the most, because I think there's some, and I'm praying to God that there's only some this way and most the other way. Some need to be reminded that the goal is not just to say difficult things to each other. Everybody's wired a little differently, right? Some people just like to say difficult things. They know firmly that difficult things must be said to one another. But some of us can be forgetful that the difficult truth actually serves underneath profit, edification, building up, right? So regardless of which one you are, maybe you're one of them that's just really, you shrink away from saying the difficult things that need to be said, or maybe you're the one that you just like to lead with the difficult thing all the time, and the delightful thing is not on your mind as much that will bring comfort and profit to them. Regardless of which one you are, keep both truths on your truth belt that you use with one another as you care for one another. Delightful things, difficult things that bring profit. Keep both of them there. And don't fixate on just one because that's your bent. And lastly, number five, make it easy for another to bring to you what is difficult but profitable to say. Make it easy for somebody. Do you think, for most people who have to say something to you, whether it's your spouse or your small group leader or an elder or somebody, for most people, they don't wake up going, you know what, today I get to have that difficult conversation. Man, I can't wait. This is gonna be great. I know we're going to have lunch, but can we have breakfast and lunch because I just want to talk now. Most people aren't that way. They're thinking about it all day. It's interrupting everything that's going on in their day. It's making them sick to their stomach to come and say to you what's difficult. So help them. How can you do that? Help them by comforting them. If you get the sense that this is about something difficult to say, comfort them. Assure them, look, I'm not a broken teacup. I'm not gonna shatter. I'm not gonna disintegrate with what you tell me. That Christ is in me. I, I can take it. I want to hear what might be difficult to say. Help them. You wanna improve your marriage? You wanna improve your marriage? Help your spouse approach you. Um, don't be like a scared person who's throwing furniture in the path of a bad guy who's trying to get you and you're scrambling just to keep them away. No, clear the furniture out of the path and say, here I am, I'll be okay, tell me. Another way you can make it easy for someone else 
to bring to you what is difficult but profitable to say is to overlook their passion. When somebody finally gets to the point where they need to tell you something difficult, it's probably not the first thought that, first moment it came to their mind. It's probably been brewing for a while. And they probably feel pretty passionate about what you're not getting that you need to get. And so they're gonna come to you and it's probably not gonna come out perfect, right? Probably not. So you have two options at that point. One, because you did not deliver it to me flawlessly, therefore, I will not receive what you said. I'm offended by what you said. Or you can just understand that there is no church in the world that you could ever become a part of in which there is somebody in there, all they can do is bring to you a flawed, difficult thing to say. They're gonna be passionate. Overlook their passion to listen for the difficult truth. Wouldn't you want somebody to do that with you if you were coming to them? You, you come with maybe a little more heat than you come with um, truth. You just kind of worked up. Wouldn't you want them to still listen to you? You see, it's foolish to reject what is being brought to you because it wasn't delivered flawlessly. Don't wait for somebody to do that flawlessly. You'll never find somebody. And please don't hold yourself to that standard or you'll never say the difficult truth that needs to be said to somebody else. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are in great need of you, our Lord. We are in great need of your word to guide us as a church. We are in great need of your indwelling spirit to give us wisdom as we approach one another. We need your fruit abounding within us, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, all the way down to self-control as we live among one, st uh, among one another. Father, we thank you for this passage that we'll be in for the next many weeks where we can look into what you have captured for us about the church and about elders and shepherds. I pray, Lord, that members wouldn't think that this is a series that is only for the elders of Grace Bible Church, but that we would as a church see it as a unique opportunity to see on a very important page in scripture what you think about the church and its leadership. Oh Lord, would you protect us? Would you fortify our leadership? Would you fortify us as a body of Christ that we might be pleasing to you as a church? And we ask it in Christ's name, amen.